So our next speaker is Tian Chen Zhao, who's going to tell us about from Euclid to Hilbert and to Lean. Okay, uh, today I'm going to talk about geometry from Euclid's aspect and to Hilbert's aspect, and lastly to Lean's aspect. Uh, first, uh, briefly, I'll just point out some uh, drawback for Euclid's aspect. As you see, he, he proposed five postulates, but but here he just mentioned nothing about the uniqueness. For example, he said you can draw a straight line from any point to any point, but it, it should be unique. And he assumed uniqueness in some of his proof, though. So he should add uniqueness. And also, he, he has some some kind of philosophical statement here, like the whole is greater than the part. Now, although math is kind of philosophical back then, but it is obviously too abstract to use. So we will make that more specific. And also he has some problem in his proof. For example, he construct equilateral triangle using two circle, but he assumed the two circle will meet at two point, which we don't really know. And actually, this will be an axiom later. This should be used as an axiom, but Euclid just didn't realize that should be an axiom. And also, he assumed the existence of rigid motion. Rigid motion is, well, for sure, it would just be translation, rotation, stuff like that. And he said, we place the point A on D and, and AB on DE. That here he's just assuming the existence of rigid motion. That actually the existence of rigid motion should also be an axiom, and I'll introduce that later. And now we'll forward to Hilbert's aspect. He he, based on Euclid's intuition, he proposed he mainly proposed three set of axioms: the axiom of incidence, betweenness, and congruence, which will almost do everything Euclid wants to do. Uh, so first. I'm going to introduce axiom of incidence. You, you first need to have a set of points and lines. Uh, a line will be just a set of subset of points because a line is just a set of points. And then we impose three, axi three axioms on them. First is two point uniquely determines a line. And each line contains at least two points and there exists three non-collinear points. Uh, well, for example, we have uh, if uh, if it satisfies the axiom of incidence, we will call it incidence geometry. And Fauner plane is the smallest non-trivial incidence geometry. So as here, you can see there are seven points and seven lines. This circle is also a line. It's just a figurative uh, way to tell you these three points are collinear. And you can check that these three are satisfied. And now you, you need to get you need to get used to think beyond coordinates, like these points, they don't have coordinates, and this is not in R square or anything. And you should just think of it like an algebraic definition, like a group or vector space. You you pair the set of points and lines, and we have some laws about it. Next, I'm going to introduce the axiom of betweenness first. We have a relation between points. Intuitionally, we just say B is between A and C and write it as A star B star C. Intuitionally, you just think of a point between the other two. And first, we know B is between A and C imply they are collinear, and you can also exchange C and A. And secondly, is that you given point A and point B, you can extend them to get point C such that B is between A and C. Oh, wait, sorry. Uh, and B3 just say for three distinct points on the same line, exactly one of them is between the other two. So here you, you have B between A and C. So you can't have C also between A, A and B. It would be a contradiction. And lastly, we have this task axiom. It said for three non collinear points and a line not containing any of them. If this if this line contains a point between A and B, it will either contain a point between B and C or between A and B. So there will be just these two cases, but not both. And intuitionally, you just understand it as if this line intersects with segment AB, it will either intersect with BC or AC. But we haven't defined segment yet, which I'm now I'm going to say about. 
So a segment, segment AB can be defined as a set where it contains A and B and all the points between them. And also we can define side, sidedness with respect to a line. So for example, uh, A and B are on different side with, re, with respect to L if segment AB will intersect with it and they're on the same side if it doesn't. And similarly, we define, set, uh, we define sidedness with respect to a point. So here, if, here we say AB are on different side to C because C intersect with segment AB. And here we say they are on the same side because it doesn't intersect. And now I'm going to introduce a very important theorem called plane separation theorem. So for, for line L, if A, B are on the same side, B, C are on the same side, we will have A, C on the same side. Also, if A, B are on different side, B, C are on the same side, you will have A, C on different side. And together, it is actually equivalent to Pascal team. And that's the importance that, that, that's why we need to have this weird complicated axiom in our system. And with side in this, we can define, we can now define rays and angles. For example, ray OA will be defined as a set consists of O and all the points on this side because they are on the same side with A to O. And then an angle will just be the union of the two rays. Also, a point is inside angle AOB. If PA, PA here are on the same, oh, sorry. PA here are on the same side with respect to OB, and BP are on the same side to OA. So you squeeze P into this small area. And some example, I also have some examples satisfy the axiom of betweenness and incidence. First, you need to have an order field K. Well, for short order field, it's just a field where you can define larger than and smaller than. And then we know any Cartesian plane k times k will satisfy all the axiom of instance and betweenness. And for some example, r square and q square, stuff like that. And lastly, I'm going to introduce Hilbert's axiom of congruence. First, we have congruence between segments. Uh, intuitionally, we say two segments are congruence if they have the same length. And the first axiom said, given a segment AB and two points CD. You can uniquely find the line, find a point here in this in this side, not not in that side, in this side such that CE is congruent to AB. So it's kind of like Huber's posture. You can uniquely extend for length of AB in this direction, and this point is also unique. Also, the second axiom says uh, segment congruence is just equivalence relationship, which is really obvious. And also, if we have point B between AC and E between DF, if you know AB is congruence to DE, BC congruence to EF, you know AC is congruence to DF. So it's kind of like the addition of segments, although we don't formalize this, we don't formally define the addition. Also, we have congruence between angle. Two angles are congruent if they have the same degree. So the first axiom is similar to C1. So is that given an angle and two points, we can uniquely find a point D such that these two angles are congruent. And note that this D is also unique on this side of O prime C. So the, if there's another point that do the same thing, also satisfy this condition. It will lie on this ray. So the angle is still the same. The angle is unique up to sidedness. And also we know angle congruence is an equivalence relation. And lastly, we don't have angle addition axiom. We, instead, we have SAS congruence, which as you know, if the two sides are congruent and the angle between them are congruent, we have the two triangle are congruent, which set or the side and angles are congruent. Now, actually, addition of angle will be a result of, of SAS. And we, I also have some examples satisfy the axiom of congruence, which will be R square and C. And note that the axiom no longer holds in, in rationals because, for example, if you want to extend this segment, which have the length of square two, 
on the x-axis you will get this one which is not really in, in q squared so and we, we call we and only a pythagorean fields such a square root of this thing always exists will satisfy c1 mm. and using all the axiom i've just proposed we are able to prove most statements that doesn't involve circles in elements book one because if you want to prove statement about circle you also need to add like circle intersection and stuff like that. Uh, first, I'm going to discuss one thing that's really re that's really annoying from or very different from your reading the book on geometry and you are writing geometry in Lean. For example, I I, I define segment AB as a set, but in fact, this definition should doesn't work well in Lean uh, because. For example, here segment would just be a set of points, but here you can define segment as a type. And the advantage of the second definition is that, for example, if in the in the first case you just know congruence of segment will be just a relation between two sets of points, there's no way you can specify that this set of points should be a segment. Or you can just say it's a relation between the four points, but it doesn't it, it feels strange to say that if you define it as a type you can say it's a, it's from sec to sec and to prop and also we can further update this definition because uh, update this definition to this one because you see th this definition it's not really symmetric for example you don't know if, if you have segment a b congruent to c d you can't there's no way you can deduce b a congruent to c d because you, you don't know these two are the same you, you just know they're inside are the same but they're point one and point two point two are different so you should have this definition which is an unordered segment and actually i have that problem in angle two which is similar like that and and also i'm and also one thing that's very different from geometry on paper and geometry in lean is that some easy relationship will require very complicated proof for example if point d is inside bac we, we need to deduce bc is intersecting ray with ray ad which it looks really obvious but actually the proof will will be a very long argument and i'll introduce it now First, we want to extend CA to E, uh, and then we want to apply PASC on line AD which and BCE. So here you know AD intersect with CE, so it will either intersect with BC or BE. And we need to discuss four cases. Like uh, first case is if ray AD intersect with BE, and the rest of it, the opposite ray of AD, like this part intersect with BE, and also the same for intersection with BC. And we need to have contradiction in all the other case with uh, Ray AD intersect with BC left. Uh, so first, if if Ray AD intersect with BE, well, it, it looks really absurd in the figure. And the reason why it looks absurd, it will give, will give us some intuition because their sideness to L, which is line AB is different because as you can see, all points on BE, except for point B, are on the same side with E with respect to L. And all points on AD are on the same side with D. But ED are on different sides. Why is that? Because D is inside this angle. So by definition, we know CD are on the same side. And also CE are on different sides. So we know DE are on different sides, which will give us contradiction. And similarly for the other two cases, if these two intersect, their sideness to AC will be different. And similarly, you can dis you can deduce contradiction. And here again, their sideness to AC are different. So again, by contradiction. Also, I'm going to go through uh, the angle addition theorem, which is uh, by SAS congruence. First, we have D inside this angle and B, B prime, C prime on different side. If we have these two angle congruence and these two congruent, we need to deduce BAC is congruence to B prime, A prime, C prime. 
This is proved by SAS and a lemma called supplementary angle of congruence angle are congruent, which is again a result by SAS. It's so important. So first, uh, we know we know AD ray AD will intersect with BC by crossbar. So without the loss of generality, we can just let D be that point of intersection. Also, we can we can say we can let A prime B prime congruence to AB. Similarly for AD and AC. So like that. And then by SAS congruence, we know ABD is congruent to A prime B prime D prime, like that. And similarly for similarly for ADC here. And our final goal will be trying to prove ABC is congruent to A prime B prime C prime. But Know that a really important point is that we don't know D prime is on B prime C prime, and we are ready pro to prove it now. First, we extend B D to get point E prime, and then we are trying to prove uh, we are, we're trying to prove E prime and C prime are on the same side, which you will know uh, you you will know D prime is between B prime and C prime. This is proved by using supplementary angle. First, we know ADB is congruent to A prime D prime B prime. So are there a supplementary angle, which will be ADC and A prime D prime E prime. Also, by congruence, we know ADC is congruent to A prime D prime C prime. And by uniqueness, first we know C prime E prime are on the same side with respect to A prime D prime. And also the these two angles are, are the same, so they should lie on the same side. So now we can uh, modify our graph to like that. And then the problem is easy. First, we know AB is congruent. And then we know BD is congruent to B prime D prime. BC congruent to D prime C prime. And also by the segment addition axiom, we know BC is congruent to B prime C prime, from which we deduce, uh, we, we deduce these two triangles are, uh, are congruent. So, and then you you know BAC is congruent to B prime A prime C prime. It's a very long proof, although the conclusion looks very obvious. And finally, I'm going to introduce what, what I've already done. I've proved SAS, SSS, all sorts of ways to prove congruence. And I also have existence of isosceles triangle, angular bisector, and midpoint. And I finished most proposition in element book one without not involving circles. And there's a lot more to do. First, we you can do segment arithmetic and angle arithmetic arithmetics because uh, you can because angle congruence and segment congruence are equivalence are equivalence relationships. So you can take quotient class, and then you're able to define segment addition and even segment multiplication like that. And you can say and also for angle, which will, will be much, you will be much more easier to prove some claim about angle. Also, you can add the axiom on intersection of circles and lines. With that, you can prove, for example, G, GCSE circle theorem, and also something about ruler campus construction. Also, there's actually more axiom on instance, but they're on 3D, not 2D. Here we also have axiom of, about a plane, and I haven't done that. If you're interested in, you can also add this. And you can also add, uh, actually most of my proposition are, are true without the parallel postulate. And you, you can modify parallel postulate a bit to, to, uh, to non-Euclidean version, and you can also do non-Euclidean geometry with, with, with those axioms only. And also, as I've mentioned at the start, you can prove uh, the existence of uh, the axiom of rigid motion is actually equivalent to SAS, and you can also prove this. Also, you, you can formalize some competition stuffs, but I think most of them will require angle arithmetic because um, otherwise the problem would be too easy. And also, you can formalize area in this. Uh, and finally, just some advice. Uh, I, I start lean like uh, at the uh, almost at the end of year two, so I start quite late. 
And I know uh, I have my biggest advice is not to to not be afraid to read new stuff. If you're interested in number theory, read it in MATLAB. And if you're and if some concept looks stranger to you, you just find its definition and then read layer by layer. And also don't be afraid to ask, and then write your own code. Uh, if you want to learn more about those geometry, you can read this book and also read the Bible of. Lean, theorem proving lean. Yeah, yeah, that's it.